So um, I'm just going to give you a little introduction to Dr. Erin here. We go way back. Uh, I knew her when she was a, a student in college and originally going to be an anthropologist. And then she um, had sort of a, an epiphany and decided to go into natural medicine. And I actually owe almost my whole adult life to her introducing me to natural medicine. Um, I don't think I'd be a biodynamic craniosacral therapist today if it wasn't my association with her. And I'll just tell you a little story about her bravery in natural medicine. <laughs> the, we only knew each other for two weeks and uh, she called me at four o'clock in the morning and said, I'm at the hospital and I'm having appendicitis attack and they want to take my appendix out. She said, will you come and pick me up and drive me to Fort Wayne to see my herbalist? <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> get up, get in my car, go pick her up at the college and drive her to Fort Wayne. And um, two hours away. Two hours away from where we were. And, um, and I'm thinking in the car while I'm driving there, this girl's crazy. She's got an appendicitis and she's not letting them take her out. She's going to die. What if she dies in my car? You know? <laughs> but we drove home and here she is, almost still 27, with my still with her appendix. <laughs> and ended up really going the natural medicine route to um, correct the imbalance in her system. So I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Erin Holston Singh, one of my great mentors, and I hope you enjoy her presentation today. So thank you everybody for coming today. I, um, I'm really excited to be here because these two <laughs> topics, heartfulness and homeopathy, are really just such interconnected passions of mine. They're so much about everything that I do and you know most specifically I have the opportunity to do this with patients one-on-one -on, -one on a daily basis. I don't always get the opportunity to come and talk to a bigger group of people but certainly something that I'd like to do more in the future because I am on a mission to change this world and help us all heal and how is that going to happen? It's going to happen when each one of us as an individual takes some steps to come to a place that's closer to our heart. So um, just to say a little bit more about who I am, I um, I am I kind of consider myself a, a meditating, biohacking mother. So what does that mean? It means I'm somebody who's trying to do, like you know, a lot of you are trying to do, just stay centered in myself and do good in the world, figure out my own health, figure out what's going <coughs> to make things work, what's not working. I've been cursed my whole life with um, the bloody, lovely curse of eczema, so it's been my greatest teacher to let me know when I'm out of balance, and I don't, haven't always known when I'm out of balance, but I've gotten pretty good at the ripe old age of 47 to, to figure it out, and it's, it's really just helped me in so many ways, so I, I've been grateful for it, while many of you who know me well here know that I have also hated it my whole life, but... You know, what, what are we here to talk about today? I'm here to essentially talk about why do we worry, why do we have stress, anxiety, why are we angry, why are we sad? So that's essentially the topic, and then what we want to get at are what are the things that create those processes. Excuse me one second, there's another very important thing happening in the world right now and I just need to help facilitate that and I'll explain more about what it is later and why I'm so rude before I'm going to turn off my phone. <laughs> um, there's another meeting of the minds that's happening right now, right as we speak, and I'm trying to connect some other people to make some magic happen. So, okay, so now no more phone on. Um, so, why do we have all those things happen? We have disturbances on many levels. They may be physical. They may be that we had a physical trauma, they may be mental, they may be spiritual, they may not be something that we readily have any awareness of or know why, why am I depressed, why am I sad, why do I feel anxious all the time. Maybe we don't even know that we're anxious. I have a, another little interesting tidbit that when I was probably about, God, how old was I, probably 30 or so, 29 or 30, I was 
with my mentor at a seminar up in Toronto. I used to go all the time and study with a French medical doctor named Gerard Gagnon, who you can read a little bit about more on my website, and I will talk about a little bit later in the talk. Um, and I got to like go from the lecture to the restaurant and ride in the same car with him. And I'll never forget, we were in this little tiny car, and somebody was driving, and he was sitting in the front seat, and I was sitting in the back. And he was talking about Chinese medicine and feeling pulses and things. And I said, oh, feel my pulse. So I gave him you know, my wrist, and he starts feeling my pulse with the three fingers like they do in Chinese medicine. And they can tell about the, the upper, the middle, and the lower body. And he said, oh, a little anxious. I was like, what? What's he talking about? Like, I didn't really realize that I was anxious. And you know, I, I, over the subsequent years, really reflected on that observation that he made from feeling my pulse which was a manifestation in my physical body of what was going on in my heart and what, was, what I had been experiencing but didn't even have the knowledge or the awareness of. And you know, the thing about mental, emotional health is that we all have these disturbances. So whether you're you know, swung way off onto the end of the <coughs> spectrum where you have you know, a very distinct, highly disturbed, you're not disturbed, not able to be functional, diagnosis like, you know, schizophrenia, bipolar, these kinds of things, or if you're somebody who just wakes up in the morning and you have a little, like, that little buzz in your, in your, what we call the epigastrium in your, in your belly, that just, you know, you're feeling anxious, or maybe you feel anxious because you know you have a lot to do, but all these different things happen on varying levels, and they then impact the other aspects of our being. So even if it's something that's mental, it can affect the physical, and something physical can affect the mental. So I'm really here to talk about the, dis the solutions we have for those issues. So we're going to get into the nitty gritty of this. What are the solutions that we have on the physical level? Natural medicine. On the mental level, natural medicine and heartfulness. And I'm going to be defining those. Emotional work, therapy, and then on the spiritual level, heartfulness, and of course there are other tools and other methods, but that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So just to define these two things for you, um, natural medicine. Essentially, to me, natural medicine, people think, oh, well, that means you're using some root or some herb or some plant. Yes and no. Natural medicine is essentially that which really gets at the root of the disturbance, the root of the problem, and takes into to consideration the whole person. And then, essentially, we want to address all of the imbalances and all of the dysfunction. So to me, that is what natural medicine is. Then heartfulness, simple meditation practice that you can do on your own or with others, and you essentially are accessing the source within meditating on the heart. So. Naturopathic medicine, I know a lot of people may not necessarily know what naturopathic doctors are. It's a term, naturopathy, comes from nature cure and homeopathy. So nature cure was a practice in 18th century Europe where there are some varying people that essentially figured out that you could apply different temperatures of water to stimulate the body's own healing capacity. So they would spray cows, crazy enough, with cold water and realize that the cows would not fall sick like another farmer's cows. And people would bring their animals to this particular, um, there was two significant fellows I'm thinking of, um, Father Sebastian Knipe um, was someone who in, influenced Benedict Loost who was the immigrant who came to the United States, um, people would bring their cows to Father Knipe and he would cure the cows of what was going on and it became very popular throughout a whole region of Austria. So nature cure is essentially hydrotherapy and the tools of stimulating the body's own healing capacities. And then homeopathy, just like to explain that a little bit further because people don't necessarily know the difference between homeopathy and herbal medicine. So homeopathy is, is at its essence, it is a, a vibrational medicine because you're taking the essence of the substance, whether it's a plant or an animal or a mineral 
or even in some cases what they call imponderables. You can even make homeopathic remedies out of electricity, for example, or Wi-Fi or radiation. And what it does is it creates a resonance that the body then responds to. So it signals to the body what is out of balance, what is excessive, what needs to be corrected, and then the body essentially responds to it because there's a resonance or it doesn't. So the beauty of homeopathy in my mind is it, it cannot hurt you. It is completely non-toxic. But it's something that people often don't understand because it's not, it doesn't work in the same realm as even herbs do. It doesn't work on a pharmacological level. It's working on a subtler level in the body, more a vibrational level. So we'll be getting into that a little bit more. So essentially, any kind of corrective, non-suppressive therapy is, is natural medicine. And what I mean by non-suppressive, suppression is when you give a therapeutic, but you're actually driving the disease process deeper into the body. And as naturopathic doctors, as homeopaths, we take that very seriously. We, we don't like it when you do that, because what that usually means is it's just going to come back and rear its head at some point down the road in the future. If you, you know, have a pain and you do something as simple as take an Advil or take a Tylenol, you may think, oh, no big deal. But what you're really doing is you're creating toxicity and a disturbance in your small intestine, in your liver. It's something that your body has to then later unencumber itself from. So the idea with naturopathic medicine, homeopathy, herbs is to essentially facilitate the root of why it is that you have the pain to go away rather than just anesthetizing the pain. So one of the other favorite aspects of homeopathy and naturopathic medicine is one, the first principle of naturopathic medicine is the healing power of nature. And we use the Latin for all of our principles. The vis medicatrix naturae means the healing power of nature. And the, the community of naturopaths, we call it the vis. So when you say the vis, everybody knows you're talking about essentially that that the soul, the, the animus within you, what is it that makes you different than, you know, this table here? You're alive. That is the healing power within you when you cut yourself. What is it that directs the body to stitch that back up? Well, sometimes that gets interrupted, right? You have patients coming in, they say, my wounds don't heal very fast. So why don't their wounds heal? Well, their vis is blocked. Their, their capacity to self-heal is encumbered. And what's the job of the therapist to unencumber what is it that's blocking that healing process? So to me, this is, this is like my most important slide here. <laughs> this is everything because this is what we're about. And even when we're talking about mental health, you're trying to unencumber yourself from what it is that's keeping you from accessing that source within yourself. So that brings me to heartfulness meditation that I want to weave into this. So I'm going to explain to you what heartfulness is, um, how to do it. I'm going to go through these a little bit quickly because that's, I want the people here who are new to understand it, understand that it's something that you can certainly try to do on your own. And then there are trainers all over the city and we have a center here. So anybody who wants to get more experience or is having trouble doing it on your own, there are many of us around who can help you. So. <laughs> A simple daily practice that you can do as long as you're 15 years old, and even if you're not 15, I don't think we have anybody less than 15 here, but if you have children or people younger than 15 who are interested, there are other techniques that we have in the system that can be taught to them. Um, a relaxation exercise that we often do to even help beginners and newcomers to settle more into their body so that they can focus more on the heart. And um, the Heartfulness Institute is a worldwide organization. It's based in India and exists in over 100 um, countries. And it has the goal, essentially, of alleviating the suffering of humanity. So a lofty goal, but something that really this is it, absolutely a wonderful tool that anybody can access. And it's really a matter of learning how to, how to do the practice. So why do we meditate? <laughs> Sometimes I... I feel it's so, it's so self-evident, right? I mean, there's, there's all this information coming out in the medical literature. 
We know that it has a positive impact on our health. It actually can stimulate the immune system. It can raise your white blood cells, it helps people focus better. It helps with concentration, um, attention. Certainly we know that it helps with anxiety and even I think can help with depression. Um, I certainly think that it reduces our need for drugs, and I'm not just talking about pharmaceuticals, I'm also talking about recreational drugs. And, you know, as medical marijuana becomes legal and moves, you know, state by state, you're going to be seeing more and more people who are essentially self-medicating. But meditation is something that can really help settle so that you don't need to take something outside of yourself. So. There's, there's so much more that I could say about why meditate. I'm trusting that most of you here already have an interest or you wouldn't be here and already know a little bit about meditation. Um, so why do we meditate on the heart? So the heart is, to me, I think to all of us, it's sort of like, it's a no-brainer. When we talk about what we're really feeling, we say, well, my heart is telling me, you know, it's not my, my brain says. So it's kind of a, a cross-cultural phenomenon that people fall back on relying on the heart and the truth that comes from the heart. One of the things I'd like to share with you from a more medical perspective, and this comes from the tradition of what's called anthroposophical medicine. Um, there was a fellow in Austria in the early part of the last century, Rudolf Steiner, who developed this approach. and he somehow had a capacity, he wasn't a, he wasn't a physician, he was um, somebody who really was just a, a studier of life and processes, and he, he was observing all of these things happening in nature and happening in people, and he, he was invited to give a lecture to a group of physicians, and they were really blown away by what he had to say because they realized that there was some truth to it. And one of the first things that he said about the heart was, the heart is not a pump. So you know, we all think about the heart as a pump, right? If your heart stops beating, you die. Well, really, it's about the heart being a regulator of your circulation. So the, the, the life force is really in your being as a whole and in the fluid, in the blood, in the blood flow. And the heart is more of an impedance organ that's regulating and giving a rhythm, not being able to focus or, or think, I can't do this. You just gently, lovingly, subtly, Bring your attention back to the heart. It doesn't matter how long you meditate. I wouldn't meditate longer than 60 minutes. That's not what's recommended without taking at least a five minute break. So, you know, some of us are ready to go longer than an hour, but if you do, take a break or start with five minutes. And then, you know, if you need to set an alarm, set an alarm. Eventually, I think you develop a, your, your body develops a sensitivity <coughs> that you meditate and an hour later you open your eyes and the clock is exactly 60 minutes after it was when you started. So these are some of the things you can look forward to when you start your meditation practice. Um, we like to remind people, you know, don't worry about not being comfortable. If you need to adjust your posture, just go ahead and do that and bring your attention back to the heart. So that's the meditation. It's a, it's a passive activity where you're essentially waiting to receive that which is really deeply within you from the source, the heart. And the rejuvenation exercise or the cleaning exercise is, is looks to a bystander like you're meditating, but you're actually not meditating. You're using your will, which means your intention and your thought to imagine smoke or vapor, whichever fits better for you, but not a mix of the two, smoke or vapor going out the back. So from the top of the head to the seat, you definitely want to sit upright. You don't want to do this while you're lying down in bed. You'll just fall asleep. And you do this for 15, 30 minutes, ideally, but whatever you can do, you know, even if you don't have time to do it for more than 15 minutes, it's wonderful to just sit and even make that thought and make that suggestion that you are cleaning what's, what's encumbered your body your system that day. And it's excellent to do this once every 24 hours because we accumulate things. We have experiences, we have disturbances, we have attachments, 
we have songs running through our head, like Moana that my daughter keeps wanting to watch every day. <laughs> Don't let go. Don't make it sing. So, so what do we do? We, we clean ourselves, and we don't differentiate what we're cleaning. We don't think, oh, I'm going to keep this, and I'm going to get rid of that. We just imagine a nondescript smoke or vapor going out the back. Then what you do is you just pay attention to, to how you feel, how your condition feels, how your heart feels, and you imagine at, toward the end of this that the source or the light, and we're not really talking about a a picture of light or a light bulb or the sun, just it's more of an idea, it's more of the energy and that, that subtle vibration is filling you from the front as this grossness is being cleared away out of the back. And you do this practice on your own, you'll have an experience. So I'm not going to tell you what your experience is, your experience is going to be your experience and it's probably going to be different every time you do it and some days it's going to be easy and some days it's going to be really hard. But the main thing is don't judge yourself. Just try it. Try it out. See how it goes. The last point I want to make about this is that this is willed. I said that earlier, but it's a, it's, you're using your thought. You're not meditating. And sometimes when you get really in the groove of doing this, you will find yourself kind of falling into a meditative state where you have no thought. And if you're aware of that, it's best to kind of open your eyes for a second or wake yourself up, as we say. Not that you're sleeping, but bring yourself back to the point, the intention of doing cleaning, because these are really separate, separate exercises. And just a note about the meditation, a lot of times people think that they're sleeping when they start the heartfulness meditation very early on. They're like, oh, I fell asleep. And I really like to point out to people that this particular system is so incredibly efficacious, it can bring you to such a settled state that you fall into a state of absorption and you feel like you're sleeping. You think you're sleeping because you didn't have any thoughts and you were so, but you'll notice that there's a lightness that's different than when you come out of meditation from when you wake up in the morning or having taken a nap. In fact, we say if you do meditate early in the morning and you fall asleep, it's best to meditate at least again for another five minutes so that you make access with that lighter state that is meditation on the heart rather than the heavier state that is when you're in a sleeping. Okay? So connect. At bedtime, we suggest that you just reflect on the day, think about what worked, what didn't work, what you didn't like about, you know, maybe some action or something that you said, and resolve to not repeat it. And then make that connection with your thought with the higher self, with the source within. And this exercise you can actually do lying down, and it's good to do when you're lying down right as you're ready to fall asleep. And this should ideally be your last thoughts before you sleep at night, so that you've got that, that cycle going. Meditate, rejuvenation, connect. Meditate, rejuvenation, connect. And just you know, using your thought to think that you're always connected. And you know, part of, I think, what happens when people are worrying and, and stressed is you, you cut yourself off from that inner self, from that inner voice, from that, that truth within yourself. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that because we, we have those tendencies, don't we? No matter how much we meditate, we might still catch ourselves doing that. So sometimes people have more deep-seated reasons why those things are happening. There's, a, there's an imbalance that's greater than you, that's, that's bigger than maybe what you can get at just from doing meditation. So you know, many of us believe that you know, the meditation really is the answer to everything, but we always are going to be using other tools. So the other tool I'm here to talk about today is natural medicine. Um, why do we get anxious? Why do we have illnesses? So we've got stress. We've got our, our biorhythms, and I'm going to talk about each one of these in a little bit more detail. It's kind of an overview. <laughs> Trauma, unresolved emotions, and developmental factors. Well, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to explain all that. So the first three I just like to point out, that is so much, you know, this is our modern lives. We don't live the lives that our ancestors lived, where we had downtime and time to reflect and settle. We are just running, 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 money, 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 go, 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 produce, produce, produce. United States of America, that's what we do, right? And if we don't do it, <gasps> slap the hand. But 
what we really want to understand is, you know, where did this come from? Did you know the word stress didn't even exist before 52 years ago? No. Did you know? So this fellow named Hans Selye, I believe you say his name, he coined this term stress. And he talked about it in, with respect to the biomarkers that you could measure that were happening to people when they were feeling tense and, and anxious. And he coined this term that now has become a noun and a verb and an adjective. And you know, it's one of the, my favorite questions for my patients. They say, oh, I'm so stressed. And I say, what does that mean? What does it mean for you when you're so stressed? Describe that to me. Tell me what's going on. Tell me what the thoughts are in your mind when you say that. Because it really is a very generic term that refers to that, that kind of clenching, blocking yourself from your, your inner source. And I really love this, um, this Chinese character for, for stress, which really the only true translation of it is crisis. And it's got the two characters, and it, the top character means danger, and the bottom character means opportunity. <laughs> but this is how you translate stress in Chinese. I think that's just fascinating. Mm -hmm. And one of the things about Selyud's work that was really, that struck me was he said the biggest stressor of all is attitude. So again, it comes back to your thought. That you can change your thought, and you can change how the stress impacts you. And then jump forward to my dearly beloved Dr. Gagneau, who was not a member of the Rat Pack. I'm sure he looks like from there in the little tiny picture I have. But he's, I just love this picture of him because he's just cracking up and he's in the essence of himself and he's just enjoying life, joie de vivre. He's just living, right? He had the most beautiful quote, stress is a communication problem with the self. I mean, it was one of those things he said and I wrote it on a post-it note and I stuck it on something and... I still have that post-it note floating around in my life somewhere because it's just, it says it all, doesn't it? If you're not communicating with yourself, with capital S, you're stressed. So how do we get back to that? What do we need to do to get back to that? So we're going to come to many different ways of doing that. One of the most fundamental things that we attend to in natural medicine is your biorhythm. What is a biorhythm? Well, most fundamentally, it is your sleep and wake cycle. Do you go to bed when you should? Do you go to bed before midnight? Are you sleeping throughout the night without waking up? If you're not, what's, what's going on? What's disturbing you? I have a, a link here to an article that was on the Huffington Post that was written by our teacher, Kamlesh Patel, affectionately referred to as Daji, um, and he talks about the importance of a good night's sleep. So I'd be happy to um, email that to anybody here, but I'm sure you can go, you can actually just go to Huffington Post, search Daji, D-A-A-J-I, and sleep, and you'll find this article that just talks a bit about the biorhythms and how important it is to get a good night's sleep. And I'll, I'll just point out, extrapolating a little bit into the rest of natural medicine, without a good biorhythm, you could potentially not correct cancer. If you have a cancerous process going on, that's how important this is. So this isn't, isn't just about settling yourself in your mind, it's really about the normal functioning of your physiology and what needs to be happening for your body to work right and not be creating a chronic state of inflammation or, or pain or immune dysfunction. So the biorhythm also refers to our hormonal fluctuations. So the big one being cortisol, when we talk about wake and sleep, um, energy, of course your thyroid function, melatonin we all know, a lot of us take it to help us sleep at night. I'm a, I prefer to use more subtler techniques when people can't sleep. In fact, one of the things that I recommend my patients do when they can't sleep is I, I recommend that they do cleaning. I teach them how to do the cleaning and I say, you know, and then, you know, as it comes natural, I'll explain this is part of a bigger practice, but anybody can do cleaning, and it helps you unencumber yourself from those thoughts and those fears and those anxieties and those things that are disrupting your normal sleep cycle. So I'd rather, as a naturopathic physician, go to the more subtle and the least invasive technique rather than a greater invasive technique, and one that's really probably getting at the root cause of the problem. So, you know, you just pop a melatonin pill. You're not getting at the root cause of the problem. You're just kind of drugging yourself with the hormone, right? Um, 
another beautiful quote from Dr. Kenyo, hormones are our sacred secretions. Mm -hmm. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that, but I wanna start explaining a little bit about how the hormones, which sometimes can function as these little molecules called catecholamines, things like serotonin and, and GABA, and norepinephrine, epinephrine, I'm sure a lot of you have heard these words, that are, are excitatory, um, stimulatory, or depressive neurotransmitters that play a big role in whether we're feeling anxious or whether we're feeling sad, have a big role in our mood. But the, the point about Dr. Daniel's quote of our hormones are our sacred secretions, I really believe what he's getting at is that your hormones and your neurotransmitters, your catecholamines, these are your physical representations of your feelings. I mean, that's just... <coughs> so, you know, we, we talk about the love hormone when a baby is born and having the mother's own oxytocin coming as you're nursing that baby. I mean, it's a hormone that's specifically associated with the feelings of love. And we even know that fathers oxytocin levels go up when they have a newborn baby in their arms. So it's not just about the mother and feeding that baby and making that milk let down to, to nourish the child. It's, it's, it's the essence and the feeling of love that comes about in this natural phenomenon when we have a, a newborn child. I think that's just beautiful. And then the stress hormone, we all know cortisol, and there's a few more of those. Um, and this sleep hormone we already talked about. But to me, this is just this is everything. If we understand this concept, we understand why all of these other things in our lives are so important. So if you've had a trauma in your life, you know, say you were five years old and your family moved, and then you were six years old and your family moved again, and you're seven years old and your family moves again, your dad's in the army, you move to a different state every year. So really it's all of these different things that happen to us over the course of our life, they get imprinted through our hormones and then that impacts what happens in the subtle bodies and the etheric bodies, and, and then what does that print? That's what gives you your physical body. And then I like to really just point out the perceived trauma. So people come into my office, they don't realize they've had any trauma, but it's really about the person's perception. So it may not seem like a big deal to somebody else, but again, going back to that question, when you're stressed, well, what was the experience like for you? What did it feel like? Tell me about your childhood. How was it? How was it for you? What did you, what did you feel when this particular thing happened? I have a question on my intake form. Tell me about the three most significant events in your life. And sometimes people don't really write anything, but usually there's a couple things that profoundly impacted you, either in a positive way or or a negative way, and a lot of times people write about the, the significant events that were traumatic for them, and then we talk about it, because how was it that that created an imprint in, in the rest of your life? And I um, was just listening to a, a talk by an anthroposophical doctor about, who was a cardiologist and was talking about the heart, and he was talking about Rudolf Steiner, the anthroposophical fellow I mentioned earlier. He was able to perceive when there was an event in a person's life and around what age they were based on what symptoms and physical manifestations that they had. So this is, this is a truth that walks across many different um, fields in natural medicine. <coughs> so I just have a little picture here of the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the different hormonal secretions just to speak to how the hormones, you know, they go all over the body and they have impacts, they have an effect all throughout the body. And this is one of the reasons why I have, you know, long thought of prednisone as one of the most dangerous pharmaceutical drugs because it, it really, your body doesn't have a capacity to not respond to it. Your body has an obligatory response to this hormone that is not your own hormone. And the same goes for birth control pills. Any young woman who comes into my office, I'm counseling them on why birth control pills are not only very toxic for your liver, but they essentially disconnect you from yourself. And they disconnect you from your relationship to the cosmos. 
So, okay, that sounds a little bit out there, but do we really think that the moon isn't impacting us when the moon moves the tide of the ocean? I mean, any woman knows the moon is impacting you, right? But when you take a, a synthetic, petrochemically derived hormone, you are disconnecting yourself from your own inner being and your own communication within yourself as well as that outside of yourself. These things are so, so important. So unresolved emotions, we've all got a little of these. Sometimes we know what they are. Sometimes we can work on it. Sometimes we don't know what they are. We don't even know that they're there. Sometimes we know it's there and we just can't let go of it. I mean, we're just so hurt. We're just so broken that we can't move beyond it. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we can help with that. Um, I do like to point out to people when you can't sleep, if you have a chronic insomnia problem, there's usually something in this department going on, either from the recent past or even long ago, because the brain wants to find a solution for it. The brain is trying to work it out, and the only time it gets a chance to is when your subconscious is most active, because it's in your subconscious. So you're waking up and waking up, and you can't sleep and you can't sleep. So just keep that in mind. Do your cleaning. <laughs> Teach you some other things you can do, too. Um, so the, the main point with all of that is that, you know, the developmental factors, I said I would explain. These mental and physical disturbances that happen on the, the spiritual level, on the emotional level, the mental level, and on the physical level can impact the diseases that we have later in life. And I see this often in my practice, so I talked about that anthroposophical doctor. Well, I do something a little bit different where I pay attention to the normal maturation process. So I know you probably couldn't make this much bigger, but essentially, in this way of thinking, it's the glands that secrete your hormones that are dictating and governing the, the development of the brain and the organs. And this is all synced. So if we look at this as three columns, you have the adrenal that's impacting the, the brain stem, and that is impacting the development of the gut, and that's a baby in their first year of life, where they really don't do much other than they want to be held, and they eat, and they poop, and they cry, and it's the, it's the brain stem that's developing. And then as they grow cl closer to one year of age, the adrenal function wanes, and I'll point out that you know we think of cortisol associated with the adrenal. Well, cortisol levels in human beings are the highest in that first year of life. Why is that? Because your cortisol is your, your hormone that desensitizes the pituitary, which is about the development of the higher brain and the kidney. So this is, this is the basis of a whole other protocol I'll tell you about a little bit more, and I'm actually developing a whole course for physicians on, so I don't want to get too, too sidetracked into that whole talk, but fascinating, fascinating stuff. Um, homeopathy, I explained a little bit about this earlier already, so I won't linger on this slide too much. The fundamental thing I'll say about homeopathy is it's, it's a vibrational medicine and it's something that you can experience for yourself. And I'm going to give you a couple little tools here at the end of the talk today. But the most fundamental thing about homeopathy, if you try it and it doesn't work for you, it may have been that it's not the right remedy. Because with homeopathy, we don't prescribe a remedy based on a diagnosis. We prescribe a remedy based on that resonance based on matching that symptom picture that a person has. So that's really what's, what's critical there. Um, one of the beautiful aspects of using homeopathic remedies is that we balance the temperament. So the temperament is all about your behavior. It's all about your mood. It's a lot about your hormones. And we, we can help with that swinging of that pendulum off too far in one direction. This, this piece around moving too far off into one direction, we think about somebody who's just irritable all the time, just like annoyed, just like you can't help yourself, you're just so annoyed, you're so irritated. So we think about that, and I think about that in natural medicine, a little bit about being a disturbance in the, in the liver function or a little bit excessive liver energy, we might say. But it's really where this thing has come in, has taken over, 
and is not really part of your true self. It's part of that imbalance in the temperament, and it's part of, of what is encumbering you to not be in contact with how do you really feel. But you really don't have any control over it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we know those couple days before your period, you just can't help yourself, <laughs> right? You're just, ah. and the homeopathic remedies help to shift that back, help to unencumber that process, as does the cleaning process. So in homeopathy, we you have these all these books. If you've ever seen a naturopath or a homeopath, you go into their office and they've got these little stacks of books everywhere, and they might pull the book out and look at the book while you're talking to them. You're like, what are they doing? What they don't know, like, <laughs> they don't know what they're doing. Why they got to look at that book? Well, let me tell you, there are hundreds of homeopathic remedies made from all different types of natural substances, and there are hundreds and hundreds, thousands of symptoms. Oh, I forgot my little books too. I was gonna, I was gonna show you one of the homeopathic materia medica, is because they're, you know, just so many different books. They explain a substance, and then it tells you all of the symptoms that that particular substance could potentially impact, and they know what homeopathic medicines treat because what they would do is they would take the original substance, prepare it into a homeopathic remedy, which means that you dilute it and you do what's called succussion, meaning you shake it, you're vibrating it. So you're taking that energy of that original substance and you're putting it into the carrier medium of the homeopathic remedy. And they would take those remedies in a, uh, what's considered a stronger dilution, which is actually more dilute, might be a little confusing for some, but essentially the more vibrational it is, the big greater impact it has. And they would take these remedies and they would give them to 100 people. The same remedy, 100 people. Take a dose of this every day. Every day. Every day. And then they'd give people the notebooks and they'd write them down. And they call this in, in German the proofing. Proving. It's essentially how they cold what each remedy's impact is on a healthy person. So they, they gathered the data, empirical data, of what happens when 100 people take the same remedy over and over and over again until they start to prove the remedy, meaning you take on the symptoms of that remedy. It's not a real disease. It's, it's not a real symptom. It's, it's a false disease. When you stop taking the remedy, the symptoms go away. But that is how they cold the, the information that is in all of these homeopathic textbooks. So... I'm sure you can all understand why I can't remember all that off the top of my head because there are hundreds of thousands of, you know, symptoms that go with hundreds of remedies. And then there are these books called repertories where we can look up a symptom and see all of the possible remedies. So th these repertories have listings in them that we call rubrics. So this is one of my favorite rubrics because somehow when people get out of balance, they tend to have these thoughts come into their head. I don't know why. But I just keep thinking, what if I die? I don't know why I'm thinking this. Why am I thinking this? What if, what if, or they think, they just have these thoughts come into their head. They imagine members of their family getting into a car accident. Like, I can't stop myself from thinking this. And you'll see the intensity, <coughs> particularly this symptom I see, become more and more intense the further you've swung that temperament and that dysfunction and that overwhelm and that imbalance has swung off into that part of the spectrum. So this is one of my favorite rubrics. Gives you a listing of like, I think probably about 60 remedies. So which remedy do you choose? Well, you know, you have to study homeopathy for a long time and sense, you know, which one of these remedies matches that experience that the person told me when they were really stressed. Or which one of these remedies overlaps with the experience the person had that is their fundamental unresolved trauma. And then we come to a prescription. So three of my favorites, Lycopodium, Pulsatilla, Aconite. There's probably a list of about, I don't know, 20 remedies that we homeopaths called the polycress that are the most commonly used, and they really match a lot of these day-to-day -day temperamental imbalances that people have. And I'm going to give you a, an example of a prescription. I think that's my last slide. Um, but the reason that I love Lycopodium and Pulsatilla so much is because they are, they can be remedies for insecurity, but fundamentally they're remedies for abandonment. And 
whether you were adopted or whether you were a child in a family that wasn't really attended to consistently, you can have the experience of abandonment. So it doesn't really matter how extreme that abandonment was. It matters that that was your perception, that was your experience, that was your vibration that settled into your body. And that is what we want to resonate to help your body know how to unencumber itself from. So just a, a quick story. I had a patient that I really only saw a couple of times. And when she first came in, she was so anxious. She was so anxious. She was so afraid. She didn't even know what she was afraid of. She was just terrified. She didn't want to go on a pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical prescription. She didn't want to take antidepressants. She didn't want to take any anxiety drugs. But she could hardly function. She couldn't drive down the highway. She was terrified to get on the interstate. And she was so terrified, she didn't even want to take my medicines. And those are, that's, you know, that's difficult for me because what can I do if you won't take my homeopathic remedies because you're too afraid of what's, what's in it and there's not even really anything in it but a vibration. Like, what do I, so, you know, I work with the patient and I explain these things and they call the next day or they email me and I haven't started my protocol yet because I'm too afraid of what it's going to do for me. So, you know, I was one of those people I just had to, you know, kind of hold her hand a little bit at the beginning and talk to her and, you know, have a few phone consults in that first week. Well, I finally got her to take the, the remedies. And she was prescribed the third remedy on my list here, aconite, which is aconite is, the, the essence of aconite is fear I'm going to die. Why do you have a fear you're going to die? I mean, there's no logical reason for it, but you do. Okay, who cares? Why? But you have this just fear that you're going to die. So I would tell her, take aconite, in 7CH, whenever that fear is overwhelming you, and just you know, help yourself a little bit. Just use this as a crutch to help yourself, to help balance that temperament back. So I talked to her on the phone a couple times, got her to agree to start her protocol. And then I think I talked to her like two weeks in or something, and she was doing the protocol, she was doing okay. And I didn't end up seeing her again. And then within like six weeks, Six weeks, eight weeks, here I'm going to Middle Bass Island to, to go to my friend's cottage with my family. And here we are, this is a couple years ago, and we're like waiting and we're, you know, about ready to get on the ferry and my baby needs their diaper changed. So I like run in the bathroom and I'm like changing diaper and somebody's looking <coughs> at me and they say, they say Dr. Aaron? It's like, this is talking to me like I don't know anybody here. And here was this woman and she was so afraid to leave her house. She was like, yeah, my boyfriend and I were going to, to Kelly's Island for the weekend. And I'm thinking, Kelly's Island? Like, are you crazy? Like, Kelly's Island, you know, partying crazy, people everywhere. And I was like, how you doing? She's like, I'm doing great. So, I mean, here, sometimes I don't even see the patient again. But they've come back to a place where they're ready and willing to go out into the world from, you know, a month or six-week-long homeopathic <coughs> prescription. So, you never know what can happen. But sometimes it, it takes a little more, you know, if you're really, really far out of balance or if there's a physiological problem going on underneath. You know, I have a patient right now who's in acute hyperthyroid state. And, you know, she's calling me and emailing me, it's not working, it's not working, it's not working. It's like, well, we really have to be, use a stronger intervention that's stronger than just being on the vibrational level at the beginning to help her thyroid settle. So, mm -hmm. you know, this... This works, but the longer you've also been on a pharmaceutical, it may take longer to come back to bring yourself back into balance. And you might need some physical support as well, meaning some of those neurotransmitter um, backbones, like the 5-HTP, 5-hydroxytryptophan, to help you make your serotonin, or, or GABA, or L-theanine, things to help you make the neurotransmitters that you've been recycling all the while by taking your antidepressant because you don't have the physical core tools to make your own hormones and your own catecholamines anymore. So that's one of the things that we have to do sometimes. So the brain protocol is what I was getting at a little earlier. I didn't have time to make this slide a little bigger, but it's essentially the same slide you saw earlier. And what, what we do with the brain protocol is we take actually the homeopathics of these substances. So they're actually made from the animals, either the, a part of the brain, a part of the a gland, and part of the organ system, and we give them 
in those three sequential modes, week one, week two, week three, and it helps take a person through those stages of their childhood where they had traumatic events happen. So this is the course I'm developing for practitioners and, and physicians that I just I feel so strongly about this protocol because I've, I've been using it for 20 years and I have seen really profound things happen with children and adults alike when you're helping free yourself from those negative memories. So we can't erase your memories, but we can reintegrate those, those memories into yourself and help essentially remove the subtle vibrations of how there was an aberration in the development of your brain and your body, your physical body, your organs. And then a few little tools for you all. Um, some remedies for anxiety. Some of my favorites, aconite I already talked about. Um, gelsemium, we have uh, this kind of underwhel un overwhelming feeling of apprehension or you know, I've got this test I have to take and I just, you know, a, a child who can't go to school in the morning because they're too afraid about leaving, leaving home, leaving mom. Um, Argentum nitricum, people who are just, you know, again, very anxious, they have some of this anticipatory anxiety going on. I like to use those two remedies oftentimes together where I'll just give one on one day and one on the other day and then back to the first one and we kind of alternate between the two. Just informing the body what the imbalance is so that the body itself can correct it. So nothing overpowering, mostly just giving little, little pulses of little signals. And then arsenicum. <coughs> arsenicum is one of our more powerful remedies. It is made from arsenic but you're not taking arsenic, you're taking the energy of arsenic. But arsenic is, is a very strong homeopathic, and you see people who really fit the ars, ars, arsenic picture, arsenicum picture, is those who, who have, you know, they're just, they're terrified. They're, they're anxious, they're afraid they're going to get sick. They, you know, they're the people who go on Google, and then they think, oh, well, I have this, and I have that, and I have this disease, and I have that disease, or... What we also say, second-year medical students, when you learn clinical and physical diagnosis, you everybody thinks they have what they're reading about. It just seems to happen. Um, so another great tool for us, it's, it's one that I implore people to have a little bit more respect for because of that whole concept of proving. I, the way that I practice homeopathy is a little different than what you might have seen if you have any experience with homeopathy because I use more of Gagneau or the French method where we use low potency that has less of a tendency to create the symptoms in a person. So I don't prescribe the remedies in such a way that you have to be afraid of getting the symptom of the remedy. You're using them in a lower potency and a vibration that doesn't generally trigger that. But arsenicum is one of the remedies we just try to be a little bit more respectful of. Um, and then kofia, homeopathic coffee, so you can see what it does, just like coffee would do. But you use that same substance homeopathically and sometimes it just helps the mind settle if you've got a lot of thoughts that aren't really necessarily about anything. And then of course there's a whole litany of other symptoms that each of these remedies address so you try to match as much as you can. And then like a podium, one of the, the keynotes for me is when I have somebody who has a lot of fear and it, it's like a fear that goes from the gut up to the heart or you'll hear people talk about when they get anxious they have like this kind of mimicking almost of like a beginning of a heart attack or something. So I think about that remedy. Um, this is the sample prescription that I was talking about that I would do so as I mentioned earlier sometimes I would give gelsemium and argentum nitricum um, one on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, the other Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday this person actually was somebody, this is a later prescription in his work with me, he was someone who was having a lot of um, violent tendencies as he was going through puberty and really couldn't control himself and you know, was, you know, had a lot of reasons to be upset and rageful and angry. He had grown up in a house with um, an alcoholic father and really was coming into his own as he was going through puberty to, you know, gaining access to his um, free will, as Dr. Kenya would say when you go through puberty. Um, and he wasn't able to, to settle himself down. Well, this prescription was really later when he was 18 and he wasn't having any of that happening, but he had become such a recluse, he was socially just completely terrified. 
And I ended up doing a consultation with him probably like, I don't know, a couple of days before his family was going to be moving from one house to another, and they were having a garage sale. And his mom needed him to be there for the garage sale because she couldn't do it by herself. So she was like, please, can you help me? So we had our consult, and he was explaining, you know, what he was scared about. He was, he was terrified of social interactions with other people. He was so acutely afraid of the judgment of the other person. <clears throat> he couldn't, you know, even conceive of himself being present. And so I just said, you know, try take these remedies, and, you know, if you're sitting there and you're helping somebody check out or they're paying for something and you're feeling afraid, just, you know, pop yourself a couple little sugar pellets, you know, we take them in these little vials and just take it. So the funnest thing, he, he did this and he had a blast mm -hmm. at the garage sale. <laughs> and he was so like proud of himself because, you know, he would have his beer, he would take his little remedy and then he would kind of get this little boost and then he was able to go through it. And then after that, this kid was, you know, basically 18 years old, sitting at home, didn't have a job, had graduated from high school, and his mom's going, what am I going to do with this kid? You know, like, is he going to grow up and, you know, get a job and be a real adult? She was terrified. Well, this was the beginning, so this was actually a follow-up when I told him, you know, as needed, take your aconite, your argentum, nitrochrom, gelsemium. He ended up getting a job at a local movie theater, and then he ended up getting another job, and his kid's now 21, and he's doing great. Um, why is it not on the next page? Here we go. So this was the rest of his prescription. Um, so the remedies aren't just the way that I do it in this layered French homeopathic method. You actually cycle through remedies. So what he did was he took Varita Carb, which is another classic remedy for an underdeveloped, um, highly insecure person who doesn't have any confidence in themselves. He would take an increasing strength or increasing dilutions over five days to start his prescription. And then once a week on Sundays, he cycled through these other remedies. And conchalagua is code word for marijuana, actually. We can't, you know, legally sell marijuana even though it's not really marijuana. So we call it conchalagua. Well, he was smoking pot all the time because he was self-medicating. Okay. So I wanted to just help his body kind of unleash and unencumber himself from the effects of the, the cannabis, so I gave him some homeopathic cannabis. And then we had been treating him earlier, so the, the lycopodium he had already been taken, and then we went up to a higher dilution, XMK is Roman numerals for 10M, Corsicobium, that's a whole nother little sample meditation. So, anyone have any questions for me about anything? Yes? Well. I have about a thousand questions, but I'll start with one. And in any case, when you talked about uh, cleansing, I think is the word, you know, where you let the mm -hmm. toxins, where do they go? Well, and do they pollute the world? <laughs> that's that's a very good question. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily call. I mean, maybe toxic thoughts is what you're thinking of, but I think really there's a capacity in the source and in the center to kind of reabsorb all of that, but it's certainly not anything that any of us need to, to worry about where it's going because it's not like my grossness is going to come on to this person and glom onto them. I mean, she may sense it, but she's not going to, she's not going to absorb it. She's not going to take it on. So it's not, it's not anything that you need to worry about. <coughs> a good question. I wouldn't have thought of that. <laughs> Did you have another question? Somebody else? Yes. In terms of uh, rejuvenating oneself, in psychiatry, the, the term catharsis is basically mm -hmm. a lot like this. So I'm trying to figure out how does one, if you're focusing on meditating and being centered from your heart, the heartfulness meditation, how do you differentiate that process from the mental process of having a catharsis? In other words, when you talked about rejuvenation, mm -hmm. at the end of the evening you want the vapor mm -hmm. or smoke, smoke or steam smoke or whatever back. to come mm -hmm. out of you, how do you differentiate that process, those two processes? Well, I think that it's a very interesting question because it actually makes me think about the overlap 
between not only homeopathy and heartfulness, because you'll often have patients come in and they say, well, is this gonna, like, am I going to get worse before I get better? It's like the number one question. It's like, well, not necessarily. But in natural medicine, like in psychiatry, you can have a catharsis. You can have what we call a healing crisis. So to me, acute illness is, is nothing but your body throwing off what shouldn't be there. So it's the way that the body uses the mucosa most often to discharge toxins. And our medical community thinks of it as infection. And it's one of the things that I train my patients on the first visit usually is to understand that an infection is really just a misnomer because the bacteria and the virus and the bugs that come are there to facilitate your body to discharge those toxins. And sometimes it's a necessary stage in the process to become well that I, of course, do everything I can to be gentle and modulate that, but that's the this. That's mm -hmm. your healing power of nature that's making that happen, and it's going to happen sooner the stronger your vitality is. So in children, they retain that capacity to make a fever, but you know, most of us in our 40s and 50s, we can't even make a fever anymore. Well, what is your fever? The fever is that immune identity of the self. So as a child's growing up, they have to be allowed to have a fever and, and address it, support it, respect it, protect them with the homeopathics, with hydrotherapy. And you know, so the catharsis and the healing crisis and the cleaning that happens in heartfulness, it's really all the same thing. Mm -hmm. There's no difference. Mm -hmm. There's no difference between any of it. It's all the same. So you can, you can put it in these different semantics and these different languages that we speak as different professionals, but you know, I would imagine that there's some things here that you guys would have your own examples about and, you know, that I've been able to relate to things that you understand because this is life we're talking about. But it's, it's how do we help someone to, to get through that cathartic event where well, you can help them with the cleaning, you can help them with a therapy mm -hmm. talk session, you can help them with body work, you can help them with a homeopathic remedy. You, it's all about unencumbering the person from what has bogged them down from their past. Not to be gross, but you could also refer to it as a mental animal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we talk a lot about that in naturopathic <laughs> medicine. That, really? Well, I mean, talking about, you know, elimination, oh, yeah. bowel movements. Mm -hmm. Can't tell you how many, like, seven, ten year olds I've had in my office, and I like, I have to really watch, like, do they know what I'm talking about when I say BM? Or, <laughs> you know, they're like, they look at their mom, like, what are you talking about? But I don't always use those words. They don't understand. I have a little more sense than that. Anybody else? Yes, Peggy. Yeah, I just want to say that I am so in awe of what you just taught. Just everything about it. Your, your demeanor, your simplicity. Thank you. Inclusivity. Um, I learned an awful lot, and I'm, as a psychotherapist, I've decided that I'm going to work with my patients with you. Great. Because <laughs> that, that. it just ties it in so much. Yeah, and I, I'm thinking of when I was in graduate school, the first thing I was taught by one of the psychiatrists was, Peggy, find the anxiety. That's it. Find you, the fear. Find the find fundamental. The yeah. Right. Help the client. Mm -hmm. find yeah, yeah. Um, do you work much with intention? Meaning? With the client involved with the intention, their intention. Well, I would say that when we have the time, I'm not sure exactly if, you, okay. you, if you're <clears throat> meaning it in the same way that I'm thinking about it, because I'm, I'm not, well, I do work with people on a psychotherapeutic level. It's not the primary work that no. I'm doing, but I certainly, in, in folks, like to let them know, and if I have the time, I'll even write it at the top of their treatment plan, because you know I'm doing a whole lot of other stuff than this, right? Like herbs and all this other stuff. So I will write at the top of their treatment plan goals and the goal or the intention, right. sometimes I write it as intention, is you know to do X, Y, and Z. And it, it may be something more on a mental level, but it may also be something on a physical level. So certainly let them know what our intention is. And, and that was really what I was getting at in that last slide here about helping the person make access to their inner being, that mm -hmm. is medicine. That is the role of the therapist. Mm -hmm. Whether you're a naturopath or a polarity therapist or a recall healer or a 
psychotherapist, it's you really need to help the person to get access to their truth and then that coherence comes into place and you're not going to have all these disturbances that are creating all the mental emotional symptoms and the depression but you're also going to see a shift in the physical symptoms because many times the physical symptoms are a manifestation of what's going on on a mental level whether it's now current or whether it's way past or you know I'll even throw out their past lives or something you took on from an ancestor that you have no idea why but this is the journey we're on this is healing this is true healing okay, yeah. we're on the same. anybody else may we get a copy of this yeah I have I can send everybody a copy of the, the slides yes so we have a sign-up sheet I believe someone has taken care of um, <coughs> you can see and if you want to have a copy of the slides you know, make sure you've signed in and I'll be happy to email them to you I know it's hard to read from there too but okay everybody well thank you I am um, maybe we want to take we have probably about 25 minutes does anybody need to use the restroom before we do we'll try a little meditation yeah. okay so why don't we just